Good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Sorry, just checking. Yes, we're after 12 o'clock. Um, my name is Rupert Goulding. I'm the Senior National Curator for Research at the National Trust, and I'll be uh, chairing this next panel. And we'll get straight on. And I'm delighted to uh, introduce Marta Goodman, who's from CUNY, uh, an architectural historian and licensed architect, and is the Dean of the Spitzer School of Architecture at City College of New York and a Professor of Art History and Earth and Environmental Sciences at the Graduate Centre there. And her talk, Just as Jim Crow, Public Schools and the Heritage of Black Children in Harlem, 1930 to 1970. Thank you. So, how do I change this? Ah, there it is. Okay, great. Thank you, a pleasure to be here. This presentation is drawn from the book that I am writing, Just Space, Modern Architecture, Public Schools, and Racial Inequality in Post-War Urban America. My research began with this building, a windowless junior high school that faces Madison Avenue between East 127th and East 128th Street, streets in Harlem. In this building, designed between 1962 and 1964, Architecture and planning maintained the status quo, racially segregated public schools in New York City. Faced with intransigent bureaucracy, struggling schools, deteriorating buildings, and entrenched racial segregation, parents, teachers, and students boycotted IS-201 starting, oops, I'm sorry, the slide didn't change. There we go. Starting on the day it opened the first day of school in September 1966. The white establishment defended the new school, calling it, quote, Harlem's besieged masterpiece, unquote. But black and Puerto Rican parents disagreed. The location and the architecture which they opposed stood as a constant reminder of their unmet demands, from exclusion from policymaking to broken promises of integration. They demanded direct control over the core functions of public education. New schools were desperately needed in Harlem, but all too often their physical conditions defined black children as social subjects with unequal citizenship rights. As the historian Jonna Perillo has argued, quote, schools do not just offer unequal education experiences, they offer unequal chances of succeeding within those already skewed experiences, close quote. And yet school education is absent largely from the literature on the civil rights movement, the debates about education that the movement triggered, most histories of public education in New York City, and discussions of children and heritage. James Hinton, the noted black documentary photographer, took the photos of protesters on this and the preceding slide, underscoring the importance of children in schools in the civil rights movement overall. On the one hand, he captured a parent holding a poster labeled segregated schools and showing a white hand squeezing blood from the body of a black child. And on the other hand, he recorded the seriousness of purpose among young youngsters watching the boycott on East 127th Street alert, engaged, and eager to learn. So today, I will address children and heritage by placing the protest at IS-201 within the historical struggle for children's well-being in Harlem. At PS 89 in the 1930s and PS 10 in the 1950s, black parents set their sights on correcting the racial wrongs embedded in old-fashioned, shabby, overcrowded public schools, they put public architecture for black children front and center in the battle for racial equality in New York City. The physical landscape is a tangible measure not only of adult hope, hopes for children, but also of the failure to execute them. And black parents cited the quality of school facilities as a prime indicator of racial seg segregation and its deleterious impact on their children. So in this research, I continue to engage the history of childhood with spatial thinking, architectural research, and urban and planning history. Uh, to frame my thinking, I've turned to historians of the black freedom struggle, race, childhood, and memory, and political theorists, none more important than Henri Lefebvre, 
who has informed my study of public architecture for children from the start. And you see uh, some of the books uh, on the screen. So the three public schools I just mentioned aren't listed as landmarks or identified as cultural resources in New York City, although schools in other places are recognized for their significance in the civil rights movement. And this is the second time we see Little Rock this morning. This is Central High School in Little Rock, Ar Arkansas, where nine black teenagers defied violent white resistance to desegregate the school in 1957. So the high school was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1977, designated a National Historic Landmark in 1988, and made a National Historic Site in 1998 with a visitor center and memorial garden. Black children and their public schools belong in conversations about race, heritage, and architecture in New York City. And in making this claim, I join architects, artists, and preservationists who are creating, quote, a culture of memory that is critical and emancipatory, close quote, in the words of the Mexican architect, Sergio Beltran Garcia. He insists this work is, quote, not really about yesterday. It's about who we are today and who we want to be tomorrow. That's what memory is for, close quote. So the US Supreme Court may have declared racial segregation unconstitutional in the landmark 1954 Brown v. Board of Education decision, but northern cities lagged in desegregating schools. New York City was no exception, a telling example of the myth of southern exceptionalism in civil rights history. In the early 1940s, 480,000 African Americans lived in New York City, with close to 300,000 residing in Harlem. 33,000 were children 5 to 14 years of age. The state legislature banned racially segregated public schools in 1900, and yet almost three quarters of elementary schools in the city were predominantly 90% or more enrolled with white or black and Puerto Rican students in 1955. Schools were old, overcrowded, and in poor repair, and none more so than in Harlem. In 1954, almost one third of the elementary schools that black and Puerto Rican students attended had been built before 1900. And here's one of them. PS 89 opened in 1889 and redesigned in 1895 by C.B.J. Snyder, the renowned architect who supervised school construction for the New York City Board of Education from 1891 to 1923. An ally of progressive era educational reform, Snyder won acclaim for his innovation in school design including capacious classrooms and the generous windows that filled them with light and fresh air. By 1935, any association of this overcrowded, old-fashioned public school with progressive reform had evaporated in Harlem. The Amsterdam News called for the replacement of PS 89 in a 1935 editorial, Build a New School, Coincidentally, one week later, on March 19th, 1935, Harlem residents took to the streets in rage. The investigation of the conditions responsible for the rebe rebellion cited second-rate education and in an excoriating critique of the physical aspects of schools described PS 89 as unfit for use. It contained, quote, in an extreme degree, all the bad features of the schools in Harlem, close quote old, shabby, unsanitary, a fire trap with dark, stuffy, overcrowded classrooms, PS 89 lacked features deemed necessary in modern, report, in modern schools, according to the report, including ample, up-to-date spaces for play. In making the case that black students deserved high-quality schools in their neighborhoods, black activists compared public schools in the urban north and the Jim Crow South. The journalist George Schuyler invoked the term Jim Crow in the mid-1930s, calling segregated schools in Harlem examples of Jim Crowism. The invidious North-South comparisons escalated in the 1940s and 1950s, and A.M. Wendell Malliott, journalist and editor, repeated it in 1943 after another race riot shook the city and charged the Board of Education with intentional racial bias. May Mallory, a working class mother 
shocked the Board of Education's Commission on Integration in 1957 when she described PS10, her daughter's public school, as, quote, just as Jim Crow, close quote, as the school that she had attended in Macon, Georgia. Mallory pressed the commission to, quote, correct some of the injustice done to the children, close quote, at PS10, also designed by Scott Sky Snyder in the mid-1890s. In a city renowned for its liberalism, in a country that prided itself on nurturing childhood during the Cold War, Mallory testified that black students coped with corporal punishment, incompetent, indifferent teachers, a condescending principal, unsupervised classrooms, and an outdated, overcrowded facility in, quote, a deplorable condition, close quote. The small, unkempt rear yard proved fatal to children. Quote, the building is so old that the children are forced to play in the street, close quote, Mallory testified. Tragically, a youngster, four years old, had been killed the previous year, hit by a brewery truck during lunchtime on 117th Street. When Mallory confronted the principal, he told her, quote, this school is just as good as any other school in this community, close quote. Refuting his arrogance and his racism, Mallory told the commission, quote, now we feel that comparing one crumb with another, we do not want to be another crumb. We want to be compared with the whole loaf, the schools that his children go to, close quote. With Little Rock on their minds, as the historian Adina Back has shown, Mallory and eight other mothers refused to send their children to three segregated junior high schools in Harlem. Called the Little Rock Harlem Nine by the Amsterdam News, their school boycott lasted for 162 days in 1958. When the strikers were taken to court, their children had been charged with truancy, Judge Justine Pollier dismissed the charges. She agreed with their attorney, Paul Zuber, that the egregious conditions in segregated public schools deprived black children of their constitutional rights. In addition to referring to Brown, she blamed the abject failure of government on a startling new concept, one that she named an invidious, inst insistent, institutional racism. The term stuck. Polier's argument, combined with escalating agitation of black parents and the escalating uh, civil rights movement overall, forced the Board of Education to take action. Both schools were demolished and new school buildings were erected nearby. However, in the contemporary city, the plots persist. PS 89 was replaced with the apartment building on the left and a playground, daycare center, and a housing tower right were built on, built on the site of PS 10. This situation reminds me of Garcia's point that memory work is not really about yesterday, it's about who we are today and who we want to be tomorrow. Marking these sites of struggle will help create an emancipatory, critical memory culture in New York City. Also <laughs> absent from public history, although not from black memory, are many other places where African Americans organized on behalf of children. In closing, I'll point out a few of them. Preston Wilcox, a social worker, used this settlement, settlement house as the basis for organizing for better schools in East Harlem in the late 1950s. Isaiah E. Robinson, Jr., a graphic artist, became president of the Parent Association at PS 139, a target of the 1958 boycott. He went on to chair the Harlem Parents Committee in the early 1960s and became the first black president of the New York City Board of Education in 1971. PS 139 was boycotted again on February 3rd, 1964, when more than 460,000 six, 460, pupils stayed home, demanding good integrated schools. This remains the largest civil rights protest in U.S. history. Alice Cornegay, a community organizer, met her, neighbor, her neighbors in this church, welcomed by the Reverend Melvin Eugene Schoonover. They organized a community association in the early 1960s, determined to build a new junior high school that would serve as an architectural beacon, bringing children of all races to Harlem. 
When the Board of Education shared its plan to build this windowless school building, Cornegay, Wilcox, and Robinson revolted. Mallory joined them on the picket line in 1966, as I found out in looking through the police uh, arrest records in the municipal archives. Dismayed by segregation, empowered by spatial proximity, inspired by their children, they took over the school. They set up an experiment in self-governance and constructed powerful counter-narratives for urban publication based on the premise of just space, racial equality, community control, and black empowerment. As the historian Marcus Redeker reminds us, quote, history is something we learn so that the living, especially the rich and powerful, cannot play, play tricks on us, close quote. The neglect of children's heritage in Harlem is typical of public history in the United States. It is also profoundly racialized in New York City, effacing the history of the long civil rights movement in the urban north, diminishing the place of space in citizen participation, and reinforcing the historic wrongs imparted by the state on black children. These stories, quote, reveal the costs of the truths we deny and the myths we embrace, close quote, to borrow a phrase from the novelist Geraldine Brooks. The failure to identify, mark, list, and protect reinscribes structures of racial oppression and represses material evidence of the ways in which black New Yorkers took charge of public space and organized for change for their children using the built environment as a tool for liberation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I invite my colleagues. Charlotte Newman is our, uh, am I on on this one as well? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Charlotte Newman is our senior collections and house manager at Lan Hydrock uh, House, which is in Cornwall. Uh, Ruth Lewis is our experiences and partnerships curator for Devon and Cornwall, just Cornwall, uh, <laughs> in the National Trust as well. And they're both going to be speaking about recreating Lan Hydrock's Victorian nursery for children and young people. Brilliant. Thank you, Rupert. We got slides? Ah, fantastic. Um, so I just want to start by saying thank you uh, for including us in today's session. Um, it's been a long time since I've been at a conference in person, uh, so this is an incredibly exciting day. Um, and really, the project that we're going to talk about for us is the positive that came out of the pandemic, um, because I genuinely don't think that we would have had the time or the space to work up this research and this representation um, if I hadn't have been sat in my garden in Cornwall <laughs> for six months um, in 2020. Um, so I'm going to talk about some of the research that went into the representation of um, our Victorian nursery. Um, and then Ruth is going to talk through um, the audience insight work and some of the mechanisms that we um, employed within showrooms um, to deliver this experience. Lovely. So, um, Lan Hydrox Nursery was first opened in 1990. Um, it was previously a tenanted apartment, and this first stage of work involved pulling down partition walls and bringing um, the architectural plan right back to the um, original uh, designed or based on the ideals of Robert Kerr. Um, it was uh, then filled with donations uh, from kind members of the public, um, alongside um, a few collection items. Um, to be honest, it was quite a cold space. Um, it was quite uninviting um, and very kind of traditional um, in its layout. Um, my collections care team never fought over uh, cleaning this space. They were always wanted to be in the long gallery or the billiard room, uh, never particularly um, in the nursery. Um, and when I arrived in 2019, for me, it really felt like an unfinished project. The interiors had not been investigated. Uh, I felt the collections were lost amongst the donations and their value therefore decreased. Um, but above all, the voices of the children that had once inhabited these spaces were absent. The sound of laughter, snoring, learning, um, there were none. Um, so a key aim of this project was to remove that Red National Trust drugget 
um, and ropes that, and to create an inviting space that our family audiences would want to explore together, creating a lasting legacy of memory um, and connecting our audience with um, our place. Um, so, um, a family of um, nine children uh, occupied uh, Lan Hydrock in the late 19th century. The first, May, was born in 1879, and the last, Alec, was born in 1890. Um, and lockdown research revealed a really eclectic mix of personalities, relationships from a range of primary source material. Um, that we had in our attics, uh, including school letters, uh, reports, letters to each other, theatre programmes, all of which um, we used to build um, and inspire our interpretation. So our research approach drew on a careful selection of appropriate internal and external specialists, student work placements and external uh, contacts with nurseries that date to a similar period to Lanhydrox. Um, and for us, getting the right contractor was really key to getting the look um, and feel that we wanted. The first thing that we did was architectural paint analysis, and this was a really big breakthrough which shaped the interiors-based research. We worked with Lisa Ostroker, who is a freelance architectural paint conservator, who discovered this amazing 1880s uh, colour scheme of um, bright purple in the day and night nursery, uh, pink in Nanny's bedroom, I couldn't really get more pink to be honest, salmon uh, pink in the corridors and terracotta red, which is a huge change from that original kind of dull blue, green, gray uh, that was in there before. Um, we discovered a varnished layer over the distemper paint. So working with a specialist paint company, Papers and Paint, we created a new uh, a paint with an exact colour match and a glossy finish so that we could get that authentic feel um, within the space. Immediately, this colour scheme started to create a more inviting feel and it just felt right as soon as it, I was terrified. I opened the top of the paint, I was like, oh my God, I can't put that on the wall. Started painting and actually it was amazing. So textiles are usually key to creating, in my experience, a really authentic interior. And using our collections database, historic inventories, we worked with our NT textile consultants and also externals at Leeds Castle, we created a scheme as near to the original as possible, but with some modern twists to make these rooms robust for use by children today, um, balancing the budget, authenticity and the longevity of these spaces was a real challenge. Uh, we purchased four Axminster carpets as per original designs from inventory records. Um, but they were not only authentic, they also had a really high wear and tear. We compromised on size to save on loom costs. And similarly with our curtains, we uh, swapped them out due to their vulnerability. Um, but since these uh, curtains are close to window seats, they're close to the floor, we opted for a synthetic washable chenille that we can easily clean from messy handprints um, of the children that we're hoping are going to enjoy this space. Um, our cushion covers, for instance, were another example. We had no clues in our archive as to what um, these would have looked like, but we used designs based on um, inventories at Leeds Castle, and we used William Morris-inspired um, designs from um, elsewhere in Lan Hydrock. But we opted for modern cushion fills so that these cushions are reversible and they're washable. I feel these decisions have added to the inviting feel of these spaces. I feel that they now encourage families to sit on the floor. They encourage families to linger by sitting on these window seats. Um, although quite often actually they don't want to because they're kind of like thinking, am I supposed to sit on this really nice cushion? <laughs> like, is this for me? Uh, yes, it is. Um, and but it's, a, uh, it's an amazing spot for them to sit and watch their children um, enjoying these spaces. So, hmm, I don't know what's happened there. Half a slide of something and half a slide of something else. Okay, so um, the great thing about these spaces now is that they begin to tell the story of the nursery for themselves through the way that they look, the way they feel, the way they're laid out. 
Um, and alongside this, we have a really special collection of letters and photographs um, and diaries from the children. The letters reveal relationships between the children, with Gerald, in my opinion, creating the emoji. You can see some on the bottom of this, but the one you can't see is of Lanhydrock Lan House, um, that he writes to his four-year-old sister in, in pictures. Um, we also have uh, traditional portrait photographs, but alongside this, we have snaps that we believe were taken by Constance on her Kodak camera in the garden of the children having fun and playing. A really key source for us was Constance's diary, which she writes for two years, aged 10, on her daily activities, revealing girls were the best at cricket, obviously. Her older sister, May, read her Little Women, aged 10, amazing, um, and she was completely horse-obsessed. We carefully peppered these anecdotes thematically through the nursery, through integrated interpretation on blinds, on key fixtures, on surfaces, ensuring that everything was family and child focused. We deliberately did not use adult focused panels um, and we deliberately tried to bring the children's voices to the fore in their language with their words for today's uh, visitors. So I'm gonna hand over to Ruth. And get my slides to work. I know, I don't know what's happened there. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> yeah, right. So I'm just going to briefly explain a little bit about how we um, found out what families really thought about um, the nursery both before and during the process of representation using audience insight to help us. Um, so we wanted to know um, what they thought of the nursery. So we've got several data sources that we could use. So I did a baseline report um, using information from visitors in 2019, so pre-pandemic. Pre um, we have several ways of doing that. So we actually operate a visitor survey um, that is sent out to people post-visit. We have comments cards on site that we could look at and um, see what people thought. We've also could use our membership cards because we scan them. So using that information, we can find out exactly what the profile of our visitors is. Um, and then using those free comments, we can find out a little bit about what those visitors thought about our places. Um, here's a couple of comments um, which prove quite well the gap between what families thought of a visit to Lanhydrock and what adult, our independent adult visitors tend to think. So from the survey, we know that Lanhydrock scores really highly with adult visitors. Um, it gets a 70% excellent score, which um, across um, our other properties and sort of nationally, that's really high, that 70% of people um, rated, of adults rated their, their um, visit as excellent. However, there was definitely a gap and we could tell that families were less um, enthusiastic, mainly because of the length of the visitor route which I'm just looking at Charlotte now, is it 70 rooms? 52. 52 <laughs> rooms, which you can imagine um, with a three-year-old is probably not going to be very much fun. And it tends to exclude those um, children, either exclude children or they're just really miserable and want to escape about halfway through. And at the time, they would not have been able to do that. I have to just say that the, the team at Lanhydrock had made efforts in the past to include children and ha did do things like family trails, there was a family guidebook, but it just didn't feel quite enough. So this is how we found out more. Um, oh, just to, also to say that 28% of our audience did say they had children with them, so it's not insignificant. Sorry, they've gone on too far. Because we were opening with a slightly different presentation, which um, was being worked on um, in June, 20, June last year, we were actually able to ask visitors what they thought with a half-finished project. So just to explain, we opened with three routes. The showrooms were opened as um, a more traditional visitor route. The kitchens at Lanhydrock were open separately, and the third route, which was the nursery, which we were working on, or Charlotte was working on, was opened as a separate work-in-progress route. 
which um, we, we then had the chance to ask people, well, how did they feel about it? What do they think about our proposals? So I went and I surveyed uh, visitors um, after they'd finished their visit to the house. We managed to capture both families and adult visitors as well. And I showed them some of the proposals that we were making about this nursery and the changes to the nursery. We also made sure that we asked staff and volunteers, so I got um, the staff to do some observational work as well, so that I could, and then we did a focus group with them at the end of the season to make sure we knew that anything they'd noticed was taken account of. This is the proposed approach that we showed them. So basically, we have, um, for adults, we had, um, we've got the collection protected, but the authenticity of it is greatly enhanced. So Charlotte did a lot of work to make sure that the collection in the nursery was, was relevant and authentic and wasn't anything that had been added at a later date. Um, for families, we wanted to create the opportunities to actually play. When we asked visitors, both the adults and the children really appreciated both the three routes and the fact that there was going to be really good provision for children in those spaces. And we didn't actually meet anybody who didn't like the idea. I did speak to some people who... Um, who did like the one long route, but they did tend to be adults, not children. <laughs> one of the important things is that we've actually got rooms in this new presentation where children can actively take part, including a theatre room, which is based on some research that um, Charlie did about the, um, the activities that the, those nine children did at Lanhydrock. Rock. I have to say that sometimes the work in progress idea, which we've done at other places as well, that I've worked, worked with, can be quite um, divisive. Not everybody wants to see a half-finished presentation of a National Trust property, but I think it gives us really valuable insight, and I'm always going to defend it. So I'm going to hand back to Charlie to just describe what actually happened. Yeah, I just want to um, really, uh, for the curators in the room, <laughs> um, acknowledge that we have taken a huge amount of care with the collections that are provenance to our property. Um, and um, uh, they now pop out of the interior, to be honest, rather than uh, blending in. Um, with uh, objects that had nothing to do with Lanhydrock. So we worked with some really clever consultants who helped us um, with Perspex cases, um, for, with, um, we, and that is how, because to be honest, that we had so few collection items that that's how we've managed to protect them in situ. Um, one of the other things that we have done um, is modify bookcases so we could leave all the children's books still on display, um, but protected. I mean, that's not new, um, but it's been really effective. Where we have had a huge amount of, high, um, of collection items in Nanny's bedroom, which include furniture, which is obviously much more difficult to protect, that was the one room we decided to leave a rope in place. Um, but we very carefully thought about the colour of the rope what the stanchion looks like, and instead of having a traditional like ee -ee alarm to uh, <laughs> stop people climbing over it, we, create, we actually put in a voice-activated PIR, um, mimicking Nanny's voice, saying, oh, this is my private room, please run along to the nursery. Uh, so we've built the security for the collection very much into um, the interpretation. And we'll just finish now um, with a few pictures of what the rooms look like. So uh, this is the day nursery, complete with a uh, rocking horse, a uh, doll's house. Rocking horse can be played on. Um, I've yet to see a National Trust uh, member of staff come into the nursery and not have a go, um, including our head of education, who's always amazing, but we can't share the picture. Uh, this is the night nursery. Um, again, children can sit on the chairs, pick up the books, sit on the beds. Um, there are photographs in there as well. Um, everything's classed as a prop, it's classed as sacrificial, and we have a budget for replacement at the end of the year. We know things will get broken. Nanny's bedroom, bright pink. This is the room that is protected by the rope. Um, 
and a beautiful terracotta bathroom. <laughs> um, do you want to say something about some of the visitor comments? So um, we, we are collecting responses already, um, and it's only been open since Easter, but we've started that process. And you can already see from these comments just how well it's going down, particularly with families. But also, I would say, with the adult visitors who are also expressing their appreciation of seeing children well-occupied, which is really important for um, particularly one segment of our adult visitors. And this is just a picture of that theatre room, which um, helps you see how playful it has become. Thank you very much. I'd like to invite Andrew Hand to talk, who is the historian's team leader and lead for external engagement uh, at English Heritage, and is responsible for the academic partnerships um, and working with... Volunteers? Volunteers. There we go. You're <laughs> going to talk to us today about um, presenting narratives of childhood um, at the nursery in Audley End in Essex. Well, thank you very much, Rupert. Um, well, it's lovely to be here. As everybody has said before, it's, I think this is probably the first time in any three years that I've actually been in an in-person presentation. So uh, maybe a little bit ring rusty with this, but well, let's see how it goes. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is, a, is a, a, another nursery that's been represented. Uh, that's the one at Audley End in Essex. Uh, let's see if I can find my slides here. Is it the... Yeah, there we go. Um, looking a little bit more washed out than I thought it would be. Um, and one of the things that really struck me when I started thinking about this project, this is a project we did in 2014, so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that maybe the, the Trust took some advice and ideas from, from us when they were doing their uh, reconstruction of Hanlan Hydrock. Um, when we started this project in 2014, um, my thoughts were that it seemed odd that so many country house visits did, weren't that child-friendly when they had the obvious places, spaces for creating a child-friendly experience in their nurseries. Um, and we were particularly keen, as many organisations were, to, to increase our family audiences and to cater for them better. And so what better than to, to look at the north nursery at this site, Audley End. So this is Audley End. Uh, it's one of our flagship properties in the east of England. Uh, it's a Jacobean manor house, probably the largest property of its day. Um, much reduced in size during the 18th century, and then during the 19th century, it was home of the Nevilles, the, the Barons Braybrook. And it came into state care in 1946, and is now, well, since the 1980s, has been cared for by English Heritage. Um, now, the first thing to note is that the, the, the project that we had to redevelop the nursery was part of a much longer-term strategy of basically improving the presentation of Audley End, which went back to really to when I joined English Heritage in 2007-8. Uh, and this involved, first of all, representation re re of the service wing, completed in 2008, then the stable yard in 2010, and kitchen garden in 2011. And the aim of the strategy overall was really just to, to refresh what had been a rather tired presentation of the house, open up new areas, and also to broaden audience appeal. And one of the particular drivers for the nursery was, of course, to appeal more to a family audience. Uh, because, basically, audience research that we'd done in 2013 in the, uh, in the run-up to this project was that only 45% of our visitors actually bothered to go in the house. They either thought they'd been there before and seen it and it wasn't worth going again, or they didn't think it would be for them, particularly our family audiences. And, actually, we only attracted to the site about 17% of what we called our child-pleasing segment, which is our sort of generally our family audience segment. So we were getting primarily an adult audience coming to Audley End, the families didn't think it was something for them. So, this is the nursery when we started the project. As you can see, it's looking in a rather sad state. Um, the nursery had only been, well, it had last been used by, by children in the 1920s, and then it had become a, a sitting room for the, the butler for a while. Then during World War II, it was the, the house, when, and most of the rooms within it were occupied by the army and the Polish Special Operations Executive. 
And so after that, <clears throat> from the 1940s onwards, the, the rooms have been effectively abandoned, just used occasionally for behind-the-scenes tours, and then there'd been damage to the, uh, to the walls through uh, water ingress and it caused damage to the wallpapers, which has started to peel off, as you can see there. It was looking in a really sad state. And what our plans were, were to present it as the nursery, recreate the nursery, which had been created in this, this area by the third Lord Braybrook for his young family in the 1820s. And we knew quite a lot about this, uh, about construction that had been started on the 30th of April, 1822. And you can see here uh, Lord and Lady Braybrook there. I think this is a pointer. Maybe not. Oh, yes, it is. Yeah, there's Lord and Lady Braybrook and their eight children. So you have Richard, Mirabel, Louisa, um, Latimer, Lucy, Gray, Henry, and... Uh, what's the other one? Henry and... Maybe that's Latimer. No, Henry and Charles, sorry, Henry and Charles. So that's the, the eight children. Um, and so we wanted to just really recreate the space that they had occupied in the 1820s and 1830s. So how are we to do this? Well, this is, sorry, this is just the, uh, the nursery space itself. It's located on the second floor of the building, uh, on the, in the northwest corner of the building, uh, and... This area was, in the Jacobean period, it was a sort of, um, it was a summer great chamber. It had then been subdivided into servants, bedrooms, and by the 1820s, as I said, it had become the nursery suite. And so you have the day nursery here in the middle. That's the night nursery. These are rooms for some of the older children. And then the governess occupied these two rooms at this side of the, of the, the building. So... How did we go about it? Well, we were extremely lucky and, for, and fortunate in that the, there were several watercolours that survived actually showing these rooms, which had been painted by the children themselves, by two of the, the girls, uh, had painted watercolours of the, of the nursery suite and some of the rooms within it. And so we combined these images with uh, a detailed study of the, of the fabric of the building, both a, a fabric analysis, we did wallpaper research, uh, we did paint analysis, in order to reveal what the decorative schemes had been. We also had quite a good ar ar archival record in terms of building accounts, which detailed all the st stages of construction in the 1820s. Uh, and what, it, what became plain is that there'd been a series of different phases of the, uh, of, the, of the interiors of the nursery. It started off with quite a plain interior with wood-grained um, woodwork and a sort of cream or, wall, uh, cream or um, white background walls. Uh, but then later, from the 1830s, there'd been a much more sort of decorative scheme using fashionable floral wallpapers. And these were the, and this was really what was being shown in the, in the watercolour with some of these later periods from the 1830s with the, uh, with the floral papers. And also, because we were able to find little swatches of those um, surviving wallpapers, and also there was one room within, which was the night nursery, we actually had those wallpaper remaining. We, we decided to go with that period for our, for our restoration. But we also wanted to do much more than just restore the rooms. We also wanted to be able to, to repopulate the nursery with the, the, the Neville children. But one of the big challenges with this was that the, we didn't have the surviving diaries and letters and whatever that other, other sites may have had. We, ha we had only snatches of information. So it was really a case of a lot of detective work of pulling together snaps of information from the diaries of visiting children. Um, and for instance, Louisa, one of the, one of the girls here, she was uh, interested in botany and she'd sent some samples up to the, um, the Royal Botanical Gardens in Edinburgh, which we were able to find. Um, also, the boys, uh, Henry, Charles, and Latimer, were keen cricketers, and they both played at Eton, and we were able to go to Eton archives and find some other records there. Um, <clears throat> there were even, we even had a glimpse of the governess, Miss Dormer, um, who had been painted by one of the girls in, in, uh, sitting in, the, in the, uh, the schoolroom. And so we had all this evidence to pull together, which gave us a clearer picture of, of what the, the children had actually been like. So this is what we created. Um, the nursery has been restored as close as possible to how it would have looked in the 1830s or early 40s, and, but it's using primarily props and replica objects. The only original item in here is the doll's house 
the encased doll's house there. Um, everything else in here is a replica. And this means that it can be a very much a hands-on experience for visitors. They can sit in the chairs, they can read the books, they can ride on the rocking horse again, uh, they can dress up in dressing up clothes. Um, and during peak periods, we have costumed interpreters and volunteers there who engage with the visitors, encouraging them to play with the traditional games and to play with the, the replica doll's house in the corner as well. So it's very much a hands-on experience. We've used the, the watercolours to their great extent uh, to try and restore the rooms to look you know, as closely as possible to how they would have looked in the 1830s. So this is Lucy's room, which is one of the, the, the girls' rooms, and that has been recreated. We even got hold of a, a, an American robin to go above the fireplace there to, re, to, to, to match up with the one which was seen in a, in a, in a glass dome in the, uh, in the watercolour. At the same time, though, we had two rooms which we set aside for interpretation. Um, one of these was um, dedicated to the boys um, and looked at their interests and activities, their time spent at Eton and what they grew up to be. So uh, two of them were involved in the Crimean War and, in fact, died of fighting in the Crimean War. So we had some of their letters that had been sent back from the Crimea, which is a quite poignant uh, record of their, their life there. Um, so that was one of the, the focuses on that. The other room focuses on the girls and their schooling and the relationship they had with their governor, Miss, uh, governess, Miss Dormer, uh, and with the other nursery staff. There's also another room which we uh, have got an audio-visual presentation, which just sort of gives you a potted history of the nursery through time and talks a little bit about the, uh, the restoration work and the, uh, and the research work that we did to, to uncover details of that. So really just finally to say a little bit about how the, the, the nursery presentation has been... Uh, has been experienced by our visitors. Well, in general, the, the experience has been very positive. Uh, the popularity of the nursery has been such that at busy times you've had to have a, a, a timed ticketing approach to avoid the volumes of visitors being too, too large because we find that once visitors get into the nursery, they tend to stay there for a long period of time. They want to play with the games. They don't just go through as they do with the other rooms and just you know, sort of spend a few minutes looking at things and then move on. They stay there for a good half hour. Um, and so we're having to sort of... We're, we're, we have concerns about the loading of the, the floors. So we're having to be a little bit careful in terms of numbers allowed in there. Um, we find it's been very effective in bringing families into the house. Now, instead of families shying away from going in the, pro in the house and going down to the stables and service wing, they come into the house as well. Uh, children have enjoyed playing with the traditional games, dressing up, but so have adults as well. It's not been just for the children. It's often been adult-only groups have been really enjoying these areas of the nursery. Um, but in a sense, it's almost been a victim of its own success. It's it sort of highlighted the shortcomings of other areas of the house, which have a more traditional country house visit appeal. Uh, and there's now need, really, to spread our visitors more evenly across the site. Another thing we've come across is something that, that Charlie mentioned, which was wear and tear. And with this being a very hands-on experience, it does have a, an ongoing maintenance cost, which we've had to address. Overall, though, I think we've, we've, we would argue that it's been a, very much a success. It's demonstrated how a hands-on immersive experience can attract visitors from a range of different audience segments. And it demonstrates, certainly, that the stories of children are of interest to visitors old and young. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jim Goddard, who is currently the chair of the Care Leavers Association, which is a national charity that is led by adults who grew up in care as children. He was formerly senior lecturer at the University of Bradford and has published and conducted research in a variety of areas affecting looked after children, young people leaving care, and adults who grew up in care as children. And the paper today will be on architectural ghosts, the legacy of children's homes and residential institutions in Britain, 1834 to 1990. Okay, thank you. It's fantastic to be here. I'll just get the, check the slides. Uh, okay. If I, ah, here we are. Okay. Um, it's wonderful to be here, particularly because the subject of my presentation overlaps massively, firstly with uh, Cara Howell's uh, presentation this morning. Um, and also with the fact that we've got lots of people here from the National Trust and indeed National Heritage. Um, I'm going to be focusing on the architectural heritage of uh, looked after children um, over the roughly the period of the late 19th century to the first half of the, of the 20th century. Um, it's, I'm partly here for, for, to present a kind of historical overview, 
But I'm also here in the sense proselytising about the need for our society to show greater recognition for this history. It's largely an invisible history, and I'll, I'll say more, a bit, bit more about that at the end. Um, I'm going to skip through a lot of the slides. There are, in fact, 31 slides, and I worked it out. It was 14 seconds each. So there's no way I'm going to inflict that on you. What I'm trying to do, there are lots of website references at the end. There are lots of references on the final slide. I'm hoping that people will dive into those and come and speak to me afterwards, uh, or indeed after this uh, day is completed. Um, but without further ado, um, uh, let me take you through very roughly what we're going to look at. Um, a bit of global context. There is a global history of institutions, childcare institutions. Um, there are snippets of it having been written. You'll see some of that later on or in, or in the references. Most of it hasn't been written. Uh, then I'm going to focus on the UK and then I'm going to give you a few points about the, the importance of this issue. Um, I'll skip through that. You can read about that later, uh, later on. Um, just to, I'm, I'm mindful that many people in the audience may not know much about looked after children. Um, they're roughly about 0.5 to 1% if you go to the historical data on this of the population some of whom were in, in children's homes of foster care for their entire childhood, some of whom were in for a few years. So this is the subject, of the group that we're talking about. So there's about 500,000 roughly in the UK. Because I'm focusing on the architecture and also physical artefacts, I'll come on to that later, and if you want to know what it's actually like being in care, then I can't do any better than to recommend uh, Lisa Cherry's uh, book, The Brightness of Stars, uh, which contains a number of accounts. Lisa's there up in the audience, uh, and you can talk to her at lunchtime, which contains a number of accounts of what it's like to grow up, including in foster care, but also residential care. So um, the important thing about this group is that it's most of the 500,000 now were in foster care rather than residential care. But there's at least one or 200,000 who were in, in residential care, many of them in these big institutions I'm going to show you. And also, in terms of heritage, their children, their grandchildren, in some cases their great-grandchildren, are interested in, in this, this aspect of their lives. Um, I start with the global context in Australia, which I'm familiar with. I'm going to skip over most of these slides. Um, because I just want to get you to... Sorry, can you speak into the microphone? Oh, does forward, it... Because we've got people lip reading. Oh, sorry, sorry okay. No, no, no that's fine. Didn't see your slides. Perfect. Yes, all right, okay. great. Okay, so um, the, the creation of the, the Australian Orphanage Museum, which opens in this coming September, is a voluntary effort organised by the Care Leavers of Australia, Australasia Network. So a lot of these um, artefacts that you see were donated by people who'd been in the care of large institutions in Australia. Um, the, the, um, yeah, you can, you can look at those. Um, the the colours come out better in the actual slides, by the way. It's not all blue. <laughs> That's the museum. It's a, it's a relatively modest Australian house, quite small. The Australian government and, and federal governments are quite supportive of this initiative as well. Uh, this is my favourite place, and it's by far the biggest institution and museum. It's the, uh, the Minnesota State, or State Pub Public School Orphanage. Um, it was the fruit of a lot of voluntary activity organised by the chap on the bottom left and his wife and a lot of other people who lived in this institution. Um, it's over a huge site. Um, co collaboration between the people who lived in the home, and there were many of them, as you can imagine, there's hundreds and hundreds of children in this place at any one time, plus people in the town who worked in this institution, there were very many of them, plus the city council, who were quite keen to commemorate this. And the site is now split between the city council admin building, which is the main building, and the museum. And... This, they've even done up one of the cottages as it would have been in the 1930s. And there's a lot more to the site than that. The Amsterdam City Orphanage, I didn't put a reference to that in the web references because I discovered that they're renovating it now. It, it is actually the Amsterdam City Museum, but for three, over 300 years it was the City Orphanage. Um, uh, obviously founded during the Reformation um, and it cared for many, many, many children, closed in the 1960s. Uh, the, interestingly, for, for people who live in the National Trust and other organisations, the orphanage bit was kept as part of the city museum. 
that it was specifically targeted at children. It's obvious from the signage, it's obvious from the layout. The rest of the museum, which is all about the city, is deemed to be mainly for adults. I'm hoping that they haven't messed around with the Orphanage Museum by the time they've finished renovating it. Um, uniforms, as a lot of these uh, institutions had. Now, the UK, quite quickly. A bit of a tour around some of the sites, and I'll say a bit about um, some of the main ones. Firstly, a, a happy nod to the National Trust. Um, the Southwell uh, Workhouse, utterly fantastic. Do go and visit it if you, if you can. Um, the Ripon Workhouse, not National Trust, much smaller, uh, equally wonderful. Then we get the charitable sector. Bernardo's, National Children's Homes, etc., which grew up, obviously, Coram long predates this, and there are others alongside Coram. But the bulk of the modern charitable sector um, grew up in the late 19th century. Um, one of them, National Children's Home, this is a small place in Cheshire. National Children's Home was basically the Methodists. And you can see from that plaque, that kind of gives a sense of the period we're talking about. It's now private homes. It's kind of, it looks like a gated community, really, without a gate. And that plaque's the only sign that there was, in fact, a children's home there. Bernardo's village, uh, much grander, um, right next to, oh, thank you, okay. Um, you get a sense there of the scale. The family museum, we've heard, heard already about that. Uh, I cannot um, uh, say enough wonderful things about it, so I won't even try. <laughs> Quarriers village in Scotland, a big site, not as big as the one in America, but pretty good. But again, relatively little indication of uh, it being a children's home. There are signs like that. Um, what happened? Well, this happened. In 1946, the report of the, Share of, uh, the Care of Children Committee led to the 1948 Children Act and the end of institutional care in this, of, of institutional care in this country arrived. Uh, but it took 40 years for the home, most of the homes to actually close. Political inertia, lack of resources, etc. But roughly between 1977 and 1987, not only did a lot of the old institution close, institutions close, but so did a lot of other children's homes. There was a big shift to foster care. Um, a lot of the incentive for this, and you can see this in the Curtis report, was to do with child psych the development of child psychology and the study of child development. Um, the Robertsons, they're in the references, but you get Bowlby, you get Anna Freud, lots of people who were, who were telling us that institutional care was really bad for children. Um, I'll skip over this. Uh, I, this was one of the homes I was in in the late 60s, uh, again an institution. I managed to get in because it was derelict and the, 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 the borders weren't very well secure. And I could tell you a bit about the artifacts I picked up, but I'll do that in the break. So, well, in the lunch break, if you want. Um, this is what I think we need to at least think about doing. Either a child migrant exhibition, for those of you who were involved in that, uh, I'm, I'm guessing some of the people here were, it was a fantastic occasion. I took about seven people who'd been in care to that exhibition. We all loved it. But what we all agreed at the end was, it would be lovely to have something similar for the institutions in this country. Um, this history hasn't ended. Uh, around the world, it's ended in America, it's ended here, it's ended in Western Europe. In Eastern Europe, in Africa, in Latin America, South America, a lot of the big institutions, often modeled on what we did, still exist. Only a few years ago, the UN came out with a report saying, we need to phase out institutions around the globe. Uh, people like J.K. Rowling, you might not know this about her, uh, is uh, a big campaigner to get rid of orphanages uh, around the world. Um, she has a charity on the subject. We now have, we've shifted to small group homes, specialist homes, therapeutic communities, and increasingly to foster care. It is, as I said, a pretty much invisible history. Um, there's a bit more about it than there used to be. Um, but not enough, um, and we're getting better on the writing of that history, but the architecture, a lot of it's going. And a lot of the people, I think as Caro said at the start, with the Foundling uh, Hospital, once the generation of people who lived in those institutions dies off, the Foundling Museum will be a very different place, and its purpose will be very different. 
Well, that same generation is the generation that lived in these homes, and they're also dying off. When they go, it will be a very, very different history that we're talking about. Thank you.